So I have a, a nice 25 hour drive up to Philly. Um, so right when this is done, I'm going to head out, do that drive. I think I'm going to probably stop in Nashville. If I can make it there, that's like the halfway point between Austin and Philadelphia. Um, so the e-com house is all good to go. Um, so that's nice. Um, let's see here. Ecom house is all good to go. Everything's pretty much set and done. There's some small things I have to um, settle with with the property management company. There's a lot of things that were small things that were messed up with the house that had to be fixed that could lead to minor pro- or uh, major problems. Like for example, when I moved in, there's all these leaves in the gutter, and that could cause a roof leak. I mean, very easy to fix, but could be major damage to the house if they don't fix it. So just like a bunch of, a lot of little stupid things. So they're going to come tomorrow morning and, um, Deirdre is going to help take care of that while I'm out here. But, uh, Oh, I gotta go live on Instagram. Um, let's see. Uh, all right. So let's go live on Instagram. Forgot about the gram. All right, there we go. Instagram. All right, we are now live on Instagram as well. Um, Deirdre, how do I drop the link if someone wants to join? <laughs> what's up? What's up, Lenny? What's up, Huey, the Duke? What's going on? Copy. Okay, I see. I was saying hi to people on Instagram. Saying hi. All right, I just dropped the link on, uh, I think, Facebook and YouTube. It says Periscope and YouTube, but I dropped it. Uh, if anyone wants to join live to ask some questions. Instagram, if you're just joining, we're doing some live Q&A right now before I head out to Philadelphia. Um, Mag- McGoovermont, what's going on? Yoink, <laughs> what's up? Andreas, what's going on? Huey. All right, so pretty much what what's going on today, again, everything is pretty much, I have pretty much everything packed to go to the Philadelphia area. Now, really cool, I was able to, I was like, you know, I want to quarantine. I don't want to get anyone sick. Um like my dad's on chemo. I don't want to get him sick. So I was just going to like take it easy, not see anyone too much here and just wear a mask and whatever. But um, I started feeling a little bit under the weather two days ago and I was, I got a COVID test. I tested negative, which was total bullshit. By the way, I got totally ripped off, totally ripped off with this COVID test. I was so pumped to get the real COVID experience. I wanted someone in a fucking hazmat suit, sticking some up my nose, touching my brain. Like you see in the, in the, the videos you watch, I went to CVS and they, they gave me a swab to do it myself. I was like, what the hell is this? Like I I'm paying for this COVID test. I want someone in a fucking hazmat suit, shoving shit up my nose. Didn't get that type of treatment. And, uh, I tested negative. Now here's the problem with COVID tests. COVID tests are total bullshit. Like if you go look it up, they, they have all these false positive, false negatives. Like, so I was like, you know what? I'm not feeling great. I'm just going to quarantine. So um, what I ended up doing was um, I use a site called homeexchange.com. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. You probably haven't. Really awesome site. You guys should check it out. Homeexchange.com. I signed up for this site about a year ago, and I think I paid like $150 annual fee. And what Home Exchange is, it's a site where you can switch homes with people. Home Exchange. So the point of it is like, oh, I want to go on vacation. Well, my house is empty. Oh, well, why don't I just exchange homes with someone else? And then I don't have to pay for a place when I go wherever I'm going. That's how. It, that's like the the idea behind the the business. Now, 
that's not perfect. So instead what they did is they, they created this system called guest points. So if I leave and I rent my place out, I can get guest points and then I can use those guest points to rent out someone else's house. Now, for some reason, um, when I signed up, I got like 2000 guest points. I don't know if they still do this, but remember I signed up last year during black Friday and I got 2000 guest points and I didn't realize how much 2000 guest points actually is. So when I'm going home, I found a place right by my parents' house to quarantine at for 10 days and it was totally free. 10 days. I use a thousand guest points. It's like a hundred a night, I guess. Three or four bedroom house free for 10 days using home exchange. So that was freaking awesome. So pumped about that. Um, let's see, we have some questions here. Chase. <laughs> Chase wants to come on. It looks like Chase, you got to hit the link right here. That's the link. It's on YouTube. Click it and then I'll I'll pull you in live. All right. Connor asks, is my real name Mike or Scott? My real name's Mike. My middle name is Scott. The rest, the the whole project, I go by Mike Scott. My real name is Mike Black. Um, when I started the project, by the way, if you guys watch like some of the earlier videos, I originally was gonna just go by Scott. So I was gonna go by Scott Black, but after talking to a couple of people, I was like, this is deceptive. I don't like this. So I, I instead went by like the whole Mike Scott. Um, <laughs> Chase doesn't want to join Chase one day, man, one day. Um, all right, cool. So Brendan says, hi, what's up, Brendan? How you doing, man? Um, let's see. Got a bit of people on uh, the gram today. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so if, if you like traveling and uh, you're not, you know, just a freaking hermit that's like, oh, COVID's going to ruin the world, check out Home Exchange. Super cool. Um, I remember I, I was looking at Home Exchange when I was like, I like going to different places and stuff. So I was like, this is, this is a pretty cool concept where you can rent out your place and then get a different place. And I was like, wait a second, this is like a new thing. There's probably a lot of loopholes that can be kind of, uh, not loopholes there. There's probably room to really get yourself a really good deal. And I already, I've gotten so much value out of it. I just literally got a place for 10 days for free minus the $150 annual fee. It's like nominal. That's how much you'd pay a night. Um, and I still have a thousand more guest points, but like there's certain places that you can specifically get and re rent out and get a lot more guest points for it and maybe go rent a really nice place out with those guest points. It's like way nicer than the place you're renting out. So I'm sure there's like ways you can like work that system. Is it, it being somewhat of a newer business? So either way, I think the concept's amazing. I fucking love it. You guys should all check it out. Homeexchange.com, I think it is. Really cool. I'm not affiliated with them at all. It's just really uh got a lot of value out of uh using their platform but i'm heading out today i was supposed to head out i wanted to head out like three four or five days ago um but i just had so much stuff to wrap up and then i wasn't feeling good and then actually my tooth is like messed up so i kind of wanted to go to tennis my dog um, while I was like packing up stuff, I was kind of playing with the dog and the dog jumped and like fucked my tooth up. Um, so Connor asks, is the rent hack still going to happen? Um, or not with your situation yet? Yeah, Connor, absolutely. It's going to happen. I'm going to be releasing some videos to like explain the new updates to, I guess the situation rules and stuff. Um, but the rent hack's still happening. The how the two, two of the people move into the house tomorrow, and instead of me personally living in the house, I'm just going to rent out my room and use that money to go rent a place in the Philadelphia area, which um, me and my girlfriend have a place lined up that's like right across the street from my parents. So the rent hack is still going on. It's an e-commerce house. Like we're trying to build an e-com community here in Austin. I'm hoping to still um, get more properties, acquire some properties um, and get some really cool places in Austin. and. I've talked to the people that are moving into the house about, uh, 
was the worst stutter. Specifically, one individual was like, dude, I want to partner with you on, on some of these houses if you're acquiring them. So um, it seems like he wants to be some form of a maybe money partner if I do go and acquire some houses, if we can really build community. Um, and I want to have some events. Like I want to get some really good speakers and stuff and, and really build community here in Austin. Um, but uh, that's what's going on with the rent hack. How do I pull this off? There we go. So, you know, the unfortunate thing is I was really excited to live there and to like live with those people and build relationships with those people and be in person for meetings, networking, et cetera. Um, that was gonna be really cool. Um, not gonna be able to do that. But <laughs> Chase says, um, they gotta think that you're scamming them now that you're leaving. You know, I was thinking that. Um, I was I originally I was thinking that I was like, shit, this sucks. They're going to be like, what the hell? Like this guy might be scamming me. Cause like he just rented out and said he was going to live there. And now he's leaving. Um, I don't think so. Like I, I was like pretty transparent with them. I was actually pretty emotional too. And I told them about um, like as it was happening, I wasn't sure if I was going to be leaving or not yet. Cause we didn't get the, the final diagnosis. So I was like, Hey, like, I might not be able to live here. And then when I found out and I told them I was a little emotional. So um, I don't think that they think that I'm making things up. They also don't know about the project yet. Um, if they do find out the, about the project, which they eventually will, um, I'm sure they'll realize that I wasn't lying, but um, I'm still going to be very involved as much as I can be. So, um, but yeah, I was thinking the same thing. I was like, Dan, now <laughs> I was going like to scan them or something. Um, we got some more people join on Instagram, Mon, Montazar. What is up, man? Uh, I don't know what this is. Cola, Cola How's it going? Let's see if I wave to you guys, hit the wave button, wave to everyone right now. There we go. Um, all right. So I have a really big announcement for you guys. We sold 18, I sold 18, oh, I got 18 orders for the, the coffee company, 18 orders this past week. How freaking crazy is that? Literally right now I have to get 18 orders out the door. I pretty much did nothing other than throw the, the listing up on Etsy and now we have 18 orders. I don't know if it's, I'm sure there's a lot more traffic to Etsy because of Black Friday and all that stuff, but we got a bunch of orders. So now I have to fulfill them. Um, and just been kind of getting all that stuff kind of taken care of. What's been interesting is people have been ordering our sampler pack. Not that, I'm not that surprised. They've been ordering our sampler pack, not like our um, actual like 12 ounce bag. Our sampler pack is four ounces of our light roast, medium roast, dark roast. So I don't know how many of those 18, I think like 80% of our of the orders, 80, 90% of those are for the sampler pack, which if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, right? Like if you're going to order some from a new coffee company that you never tried, you, you're going to want to try the sampler pack first and then order more. What I've also realized a lot of people are buying these as gifts. They're not buying it for themselves. They're buying it as gifts. The very first order we got, which was so exciting, very first order I got, they left us an amazing review. Um, I actually gave her a 12-ounce bag of coffee with her sampler pack as a thank you for being our very first customer. Such an exciting moment. I've never, I've never had an e-commerce company before. So when you get your first order, you're like, oh my God, this is crazy. And now we're, we have 18 orders. Um, I'm sure 18 orders in a month or two is going to be like, 18 orders, nothing. Um, but right now it's like, wow, this is super cool. All I did was throw this on Etsy. Um, so that was pretty cool. You're just yelling. That's not all we did. Um, <laughs> Ethan says, are you planning to run Facebook ads? Yes, Ethan. Um, definitely running Facebook ads. Um, so a big part of the growth is going to be Facebook ads, because it's very scalable, as well as influencer marketing. Um, just with the whole situation going on with having to move, um, I haven't been able to get those Facebook ads up. The goal was to have it up like two weeks ago. 
Um, but don't have any of that up yet, but we will be running Facebook ads and, uh, Facebook ads are great cause they're scalable. Um, so I'm also running ads on Etsy. So Etsy, you can run like sponsored ads. I think I set the budget to like 20 bucks a day. Here's the thing with Etsy though. It's not spending that 20 bucks. We've only spent like $30 so far on Etsy, which is like, it's kind of annoying. Like, like our ROAS is so high, our return on ad spend, because we're getting so many orders that I wish they were spending way more money. I wish they were just blowing through that $20 every single day, but they're not. Over the last week, like I said, I think it's been like 30 bucks. Um, so Ethan asks, what's your target demographic, age, and gender? So our target demographic um, is people that love dogs, dog lovers. Now, my assumption going into this, which has been proven to be true, is that women are going to be our main customer. And let me pull my Etsy store up. I think not one order was from, I think all, all our, our orders were from women. Um, let me take a look. Going into my shop right now. Let's see. Oh, here's another thing that I was right on. I'll explain in a second. I do want to double check. Um, okay, Sandra, Jordan, Sam, Rebecca, Amy. Yep, these are all women. So like every single order, women. So um, you know that that tells you a little bit about who's going to be most interested in buying this uh, type of product. So. Um, I think that's really interesting. The other thing that's really interesting for those of you watching, my assumption going into this is like we're building a coffee company. Like we've spent, a, you guys haven't really gotten to see it, but we spent a lot of time making sure that we're producing really, 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 really amazing coffee. And we're going to be putting out a lot of different blends moving forward. We just wanted to start with these three blends, light, medium, dark, uh, these three coffee products to start, but we're going to be releasing a bunch of others. And, um, people that are like coffee snobs, they buy the coffee whole bean. People that aren't coffee snobs want it ground because you don't have a grinder, right? So going into this, I was like, you know what? I think people aren't going to buy whole bean. I think it's mostly going to be orders for ground coffee because I've said this so many times, um, I think on the live stream and say it all the time is we're not a coffee company we're a company with a mission to save as many dogs as possible. We're not a coffee company. We sell coffee that's really good, but our mission is to save as many dogs as possible. I don't think people are going to be buying whole bean as much as ground. Now, if we were a coffee company and that was the market, and I was like, I want to build a coffee company. We're going to compete with all the other coffee companies, and I guarantee you that would flip. Like, let's say like 90% of our orders right now are ground and 10% are whole bean. It would probably flip. Most orders would be whole bean, the rest would be ground. So think about those things when you're building your own e-commerce company is you start at the top level of who am I serving? Who is who is the person I'm serving? And for us, it's people that are obsessed with dogs. So um, because of that, I assume that it'd be more ground and, and so far that's been proven to be true. Also, the one thing I did not take into consideration, which has been, um, looks like it's the case. I think a lot more people buy these as gifts than they do for themselves. So that's something to really pay attention to because in your marketing, you want to be using that terminology. Like here's something to gift people for the holidays or here's, this is a gr this makes a great gift if it's not the holidays, et cetera. Um, okay. So, uh, let's see. Connor asks, what is your net profit from somebody buying a bag with all costs included? So Connor, it's super hard to, to answer. So like, you, you know, when I, when I, if you asked me this question like three years ago, four years ago, and you're like, I used to look at people and be like, you share your revenue number, but revenue doesn't matter. What's your profit? I want to know your profit. The thing is you can manipulate profit um, in a good way or a bad way. So you could have, you could be unprofitable for five years, but have a freaking awesome company that 
you're just taking every single dollar and putting it into marketing. So like you make, you spend a dollar on ads, you make five bucks and you take all that five bucks and put it back into ads, you're going to look like you're unprofitable. So I don't, I don't like breaking things down by net profit. Um, you could also make your company very profitable and just feed yourself and not the business. I can make the company make $300,000 in profit a year. And that means that I'm the company's profitable, but how much am I giving to myself versus putting back in the business? So on, a, on an income statement, at the top of the income statement, you have revenue and then you have cost of goods sold. What I'd like to break this down into is we'll call it revenue at the very top. Then we'll have cost of goods sold, which will include the actual coffee, the bags, the stickers, and I'll also include ad spend. Now, the problem, Connor, is I don't know what it will cost me to acquire a customer yet. I'm too early. I just don't know if I spend a dollar, do I make back $2? If I spend a dollar, do I make back $3? I don't know Um, because I'm not doing Facebook ads. I'm just really on Etsy right now. Um, the, we have, I built the Shopify store. That's all good to go. It's in a really good spot, but I haven't run ads. We haven't done a single sale yet on Shopify. So to answer your question right now, as of right now, the, I'm not sure what the revenue is. I have to look on Etsy, but we probably do. The other thing to consider is I don't know shipping yet. I, I would say like probably 20 to 25% profit without marketing. Now I'm going to take every single dollar and put it into marketing and try to make the company not make money. If that makes sense. If the company doesn't make money, that's a win. I want to put everything into marketing. I don't want to pay myself for a very long time. And then 20% of profits, obviously we're donating. Um, so those are just some things that taking to consideration is we're going to be plowing back a lot of capital. And I think everyone, if their goal is I want to build this company to the moon, you need to plow back everything you make so you can invest in hiring good people. You can invest in marketing awareness. You can invest in making your product better. Um, but I just don't know the answer to this, Connor. A lot of, there's a lot of things I just don't know too, like shipping. I'm learning all things about shipping, how that all works. Um, so that kind of plays into effect because, um, like we're not charging enough for shipping right now, but we increase our price a little bit. So figuring that type of stuff out. Um, if you, Connor, if you ask me the same question in six months, I'll have a really good answer for you. Cause I do, I always know my numbers really well, but just too early. Also one thing to point out guys, I don't give a shit about being profitable right now at all. I just want to get, if I break even after marketing expenses, that's all I care about. Because if someone's buying a sampler pack, we break even on everything. That means one more person has our product to spread awareness. So that's what I care about right now. Obviously, I want to be profitable. So we're making profit. I just don't know what the exact margin is just yet. Because this just happened this last week. Um, Andrew asks, where are you living? Andrew, I'm moving to uh, Bucks County area. Um, I'm moving back uh, within like a couple miles from where my parents live. Um, Ethan asks, how much does one unit cost you? How much are you selling one unit for net profit? That's so Ethan, that's not net profit. That's gross margin. Um, so one unit, it's expensive. So like, it depends on wh which product we're selling, but it can cost like with all expenses anywhere from eight fifty to nine dollars or even more. And then we sell it with shipping for like twenty one ninety nine, maybe something like that. Nineteen ninety nine. I don't know. Um, it depends on what the shipping is going to cost us. So if we sh if we sell it, I think what we just what I decided is I was like, you know what, I'm going to sell this. And I'm just gonna do a flat rate shipping of $5.95. And I think I listed them for $13.99 a bag with $5.95, but I lose money on the shipping. So I can make like four or five bucks on each bag, I guess. But then you gotta take into account the AOV. People are ordering potentially more than one. Our AOV actually is pretty good. 
um, for the little data that I have. So that's another thing we have to consider. Um, okay, we have another question. We have a question from Instagram. Uh, let me just try to get to this question on Instagram. Where is it? Okay. Uh, Jake, Jacob asks, hey, how do you get social media strategists? We have great graphic de designers, but don't know how to grow accounts and strategize the content or even how to use Facebook ads. Okay, Jacob. Um, so, what you, oop, I did not mean to do that. Let me pin your comment there. Did it work? I don't know. Yeah, okay, so Jacob, um, that's super cool that you have good designers. You, you need, I would call that role an account management role, Jacob. Um, so you want someone that, that can serve as an account manager, that can do strategy, that can run accounts, that can see projects through from start to finish minus doing the actual design work. That's a hard role to, to hire for, but you definitely need to hire for it as quickly as you can. Um, so those types of people cost more money. Um, but they should be able to communicate with clients and they should be able to make sure that people are hitting deadlines. So they're almost like in a, like a strategist slash, um, uh, what is the word? Like project manager. Um, you can find them on Upwork. I've uh, hired a few of those roles myself. You really need to hire for leadership. Like, would you feel comfortable putting this person in front of a client? The answer is yes, that's good. Then I always compare the person to myself. I go, okay, if who would do better in front of a client, me or that person? And if that person doesn't even come close, then off the table. If I'm like, wow, this person is either better than me or they would totally crush communicating with a client, creating strategy, managing people. You got to interview for the leadership skills. You got to, got to, got to interview for the leadership skills there. It's a very hard hire to make interview a lot of people then the best way to test it and here's one thing that i learned from a lot of past mistakes is like be really hard like i wasn't being hard enough on people um be really hard on your interviewing process like if you don't see inter leadership experience in the resume absolutely not i want to see your leadership experience like this is a leadership role if you're doing an account strategist role this is a leadership role if they have account experience in the past, it's also a great indicator that they might be able to do it. Um, if you read the book, Who by Geoff Smart, which I would suggest you do, Jacob. It's my favorite book of all time on hiring, Who by Geoff Smart. Cannot recommend it enough. Um, what kind of what it talks about is like the best indicator of success is that they've done it previously, right? So like if you have someone that was in that same role at a different company, that's a good indicator uh, they might be able to do it. So interview for leadership, interview that they can hit deadlines and then put a test in place to see if they can actually do it. Maybe give them a test project for a client you're currently working with, maybe something internal and like have them take the lead on it and use your designers to get that deliverable out and see how they do. Do they do what they say they do? Do they take a good approach? Do they problem solve well? Do they communicate well? I want to see, are they communicating well? Like are they, if, are they, if this is like a three-day project, are they updating me every day? Are they saying like, hey, I got through this. This has been easy. Are they asking the right questions? Is it account strategy? Is it a consulting role? Like you need to be able to ask the right questions. So hopefully that answers your question. If you have follow-up questions, uh, Jacob, feel free to drop them or DM me. Okay, so um, let's see. Back to YouTube. Um, Ethan asks, Ethan says, you just want ca customer satisfaction, correct? The more customers you have, the more free marketing word of mouth you get. Yeah, Ethan, that, that, there's a lot of things that are important to me. It's it obviously customer satisfaction right now is great. I want to get as many orders out the door as possible, um, even if it's break even, because one, like you said, word of mouth, but two, I get to start learning my process here. Like I get to start learning how to do fulfillment, how to fulfill orders. What are people saying? What is the feedback? Do they love the product? Is there other things that they would like more about the product? I, the, the thing that I get out of this is learning. So I get to learn a lot about my, my customer. I get to learn a lot about um, how to make the product better, how to make the marketing better, how to make the branding better. And then break even word of mouth is incredible because 
theoretically, you're spending zero to get the word out, right? If you're breaking even. Um, if you're profitable, that's even more incredible. So, uh, and obviously you want to be profitable because then you can, if you're profitable, put that money into marketing. Um, okay, back to a social media question. Um, uh, Jacob asked another question, which Jacob I'll get to in just a second here. Okay, so Andreas asks, are you still doing any social media management? Yes, I still have one client. Uh, if you've been following the vlog, what I decided to do is I am just going to stick with this one client. I don't want any other clients. I've actually turned down three or four people now that actually just wanted consulting. They didn't even want um, necessarily the management. And that's what I'm pushing people towards, by the way, like, um, which I declined. Um, but outside of this, like, I want to do consulting. I don't want to do the execution work because it's much more scalable to bring in a client, teach them how to do it. They get a lot of value out of it being taught. And then it's a kind of a value ladder where then you can maybe charge more for execution if they want the execution. But you really, for me, I really want to push more people towards consulting. I, I don't love building um, a social media marketing agency um, versus like a development agency like Toll Media. It's much easier to build a development agency, I'd say, than a social media marketing agency. Um, because the projects are much higher budget when you're working with social media marketing, the budgets aren't nearly as high. Like, like in the social media marketing world, you land a $10,000 client. You're like fucking hype. You're like, holy shit. Incredible. In the dev world, that's fucking peanuts. Like that's like, ah, uh, okay. It's, I don't know if I should sign that or not. Um, so that's kind of how I feel about the whole marketing stuff. Um, so to answer your question though, Andreas, I decided I'm the only reason I was doing social media marketing was to pay the bills and to get a little capital to invest in my e-com company. Now that I'm financially stable and my bills are paid and I have a little excess capital, I want to be a hundred percent focused on the, the uh, e-com business. So I'm not getting any more clients now outside of this project. Um, MDC, the company that I created to build, to, to produce and market the project. We're in discussions of how do we make revenue as a company? Maybe we should do consulting. Maybe we should do execution. So we're start, starting to look at that stuff. Cause right now I personally out of pocket spend $20,000 a month on producing all the content we produce, putting out all the marketing that we put out that costs me out of pocket, 20 grand a month. So we want to start covering those costs. We have zero revenue coming in from MDC. So we want to start covering some of those costs. So we're thinking about doing some types of like consulting and execution for people um, and maybe some types of training on how we do all of this. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, okay, back to Instagram. Then I see we have Sunny asked a question on YouTube and Connor. So I'll get, you, I'll get that to you in a second. Um, let me just answer this Instagram question. So Jacob says... I had answered his question previously. He says, thank you. How much do you think we should charge for marketing services? That's a very loaded question, Jacob. Um, it matters what, you ha what you're doing, right? Like, what should I charge to develop software? I don't know. Like, <laughs> what, what, are you what are you doing? Um, if you are managing their Instagram account and doing one post a, a week versus seven posts a week, versus also managing TikTok and, and LinkedIn and Facebook, et cetera, versus YouTube, um, versus creating video content, graphic content. Like this all depends. Are you running ads? Are you doing design? Like all this stuff, figure out how long it takes to do this type of stuff. And I would suggest doing monthly retainer. Don't do hourly um, or anything like that. Like if you can get towards monthly retainers, that's where the game's at. Um, I think that's pretty standard in this world too, I would assume. So um, get to monthly returns. The one thing I'll say is don't undercharge for your services. Um, like look what other people are doing, talk to other people, figure out what they're charging for their services, figure out where like people kind of fall in the middle. And I, I mean, personally trying to aim for the higher tier, um, but you know your value, right? Like figure out that value you bring to the table and charge for the value. Um, but there's a lot of different ways you can go about doing it. So it, it's super hard to, to answer. Um, 
Okay. Blanca Del Cruz, how's it going? Ask, is this a Q&A correct? So if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Be happy to answer them. Um, Jacob says, also the monthly retainers, we aren't sure how to structure those as well. Um, so Jacob, this is what I did. It's really not super challenging. I don't know if I'm, I'm not going to suggest you do the same thing because of the legality stuff here, but I just went on Google. I looked up for a retainer template contract and I just changed some clauses, but I, I've been doing this for a little bit. So I know what clauses I want to include in a contract. So you kind of want to be a little bit careful with, um, you know, talk to a lawyer. Um, but I just got a template and I just use that. And pretty much what is important to know for everyone watching, whether it's a marketing company, any type of agency, accounting company, law firm, prepayment, have people prepay for your services. Do not sign a monthly retainer, uh, Jacob. Don't do a monthly retainer where they pay after 30 days or have like a net 30 BS, all that stuff. I don't do that crap. It's up front. So it, tomorrow's December 1st. So actually, I think I was probably paid today. I think you go check my bank account. I was paid today by my social media client for the next month. Always do prepayment. Now, here's how you frame prepayment. Okay. Let's say you want a, I'm going to make it easy. Uh, let's say you want a $10,000 retainer. Um, if that's what you charge, let me get this message off here. If you charge a $10,000 retainer for whatever the service you're pitching and you want to get prepayment, I tell them, Hey, look, I, I increase it by 20%. So if you do a 20% increase on that, it's $12,000. I say, Hey, look, we charge $12,000 a month, but if you prepay for the, the next month, we only charge 10,000. So now what this will do is if they opt in to not do prepayment, which is a very bad sign, by the way, guys. That means there's some form of capital issue they have probably. 20% is a lot. So if they opt not in to do that, then that 20% makes up for all the risk involved of you having to float that capital to pay people. It makes up for all the risk involved for them defaulting. It makes up for all the risk of you having to um, uh, get a line of credit with a bank. Like it told media, there was times I was floating $50,000, $100,000. That's a lot of fucking money. Now, if I go, go get a loan for fifty dollars to $100,000, I'm going to pay like 6% on that. That costs money, right? So that 20% that you increase makes up for that, makes up for the risk. I, have, I had a client, total piece of shit, scumbag, lady, lunatic, uh, defaulted on $35,000. We're never going to see that $35,000. So you got to make up for this, this stuff. And that's how I do it if they don't prepay. So again, very simple. If you want 10 grand, say it's $12,000, but if you prepay 10,000, 20% rule. Hopefully that's helpful, Jacob. Um, okay. We do have some more questions coming on YouTube. Um, let's see. So one more on Instagram, then we're gonna go back to YouTube here. Someone ask, uh, Reese Monarch asks, <laughs> what's your favorite color? Um, I don't know. Blue. I like blue. Blue's cool. Um, okay. So, Sunny, let's get to you. Sunny asks, do you have an organic content marketing strategy? And then TikTok with a question. So, um, yeah, Sunny. So, here's the thing. Organic is really tough. That's what I learned doing this project. Organic is really, really, really tough, but you need to have organic strategy. So organic strategy, and we're actually changing this up internally a little bit. It depends on the platform, Sonny. Like all organic strategy is different for each platform. The main platforms, Instagram. Your strategy should not be let's blow up organically on Instagram. It's going to be really hard to do that very, very, very hard today. You need to spend money to grow on Instagram. That's just how it is. Um, or there needs to be external sources outside of ads that are driving that traffic to your Instagram account. So that's the organic strategy for Instagram. Put out really high quality content and put out, I would say less. That's what we're going to start doing internally. Higher quality content, less. Um, then for LinkedIn and TikTok organic, 
that is where you're getting the most viewership by far. We have like 50,000 followers on TikTok. We even spent a dime on TikTok. Um, I always say we, so I think of the MDC team when I'm talking, um, but it's my TikTok account. 50,000 followers on TikTok. Um, that's all organic. So what I would suggest, Sonny, is go super hard on TikTok. Very, 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 very hard on TikTok. Now, what's great about TikTok is you can repurpose the TikTok content for Instagram Reels, and also you, you could put it on other platforms as well, especially in Stories. So, um, if I big part of my Instagram organic strategy is Reels. Right now, Reels is only thirty seconds. It started off at fifteen. It's now at thirty. It's going to go to a minute eventually. I just don't know when. Um, so. You want to learn how to create that quick, short form video content um, because YouTube's going to have YouTube shorts. I'm sure, I don't know, fucking Twitter might fucking launch the version too. Like it's all up in the air. Like you don't know, but that's where a lot of things are moving. So I would be really studying TikTok and what types of content work well on TikTok and what types of content people are consuming there. So I'd be really big on TikTok if I were looking at organic. Then LinkedIn, I'm by no means an expert at LinkedIn. Um, actually, we just reached out to someone who's really awesome at LinkedIn, and we scheduled a call to um, to learn how to do better on our LinkedIn. Um, and Kirsten on our team knows all the details on that. I do want to give him a shout out because it was very nice of him to spend some time with us. It was, uh, let's see, his name's Joseph Choi. Joseph C H O I Joseph Choi is a total killer on LinkedIn. And he was nice enough to spend some time with Kirsten on a call, um, to explain how we should, we can do better with our LinkedIn content. Um, so you need to approach everything differently. Um, Oh, sorry. I just saw this part. Okay. So you're asking specifically for the coffee company. So for the coffee company, Sonny, lot different than for Mike Black, right? So um, the, the strategy for social for the coffee company is, the, and this is something we're going to have to learn as we go. It's not super different though. I'm just probably not going to leverage LinkedIn as much for the, the content that we put out. It's going to be very big on TikTok, super big on TikTok. If I had to pick one thing to just spend all time and effort, it's going to be TikTok. The second thing is going to be um, Instagram. So it's gonna be a lot of TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. I'm probably just gonna punt Twitter and LinkedIn. And I'm just gonna focus on those to start. Um, but, or maybe just repurpose like Facebook to those other ones. Now here's in, what's important, Sonny. Selling a physical product. Uh, we're selling coffee. So the big part of our social media strategy is utilizing our customers so I want our customers posting on social media. So I can't share what we're doing because it's a big part of what we're doing as a, as a company that I'll, I'll probably share with everyone in a month or so. But there's something we're doing to get a lot more sales with our product. Um, in just from a product stance, not a marketing standpoint. But it actually affects marketing really heavily where we're doing some customizable stuff. And it's going... My assumption is we're going to have a much higher viral coefficient of people sharing it on social media. So in every single um, order of coffee that we ship out, we're going to be placing uh, slips that pretty much are cards that say, hey, take a picture with your coffee and your dog and um, tag us on social media and we'll share your stuff on our, our page. So uh, I don't know what to call that. It's not like influencer marketing, customer marketing. I don't know if there's a name for it. If someone knows what the name is, let me know. But that's our big strategy is like really hitting that super hard. And then influencer marketing as well. We're going to give a lot of free bags out to influencers to share on their page and give their followers a discount. Um, so I hope that's helpful. I just accidentally licked the mic. <laughs> um, okay. Let's see here. Okay, Connor asks, do you still own Toll Media or did you sell it? I still own Toll Media, still do client meetings, I still do team meetings, um, but our team has been awesome. They're just handling pretty much everything and I, I've been pretty hands-off for the most part. Um, Review Find says organic's useless. 
it's all untargeted traffic anyway. Um, I don't agree with that for TikTok at all, with 50,000 followers. Um, but I do for Instagram. It's pretty tough. Um, so that's how I feel about that. Um, oh, and LinkedIn. Even though we're not like crushing how we're doing LinkedIn, um, we do get a lot of views sometimes and uh, we can do better. And I know a lot of people are doing really well on LinkedIn. So um, let's see. Dr. Rapasi says, uh, Cupshe does the same thing to sell swimsuits. It works really well. Yeah, I, th I think like, guys, if you're, if you're running an e-commerce business, I, I feel weird saying this because I'm this is my first e-com business, so I'm not an expert. But my my intuition is that your customers are what sell your product. So you want <laughs> Deirdre's yelling social proof. It's not just social proof though. It's which it, it, yeah, social proof, but like your customers. It's all about your customers versus like a, a B2B company. It's it's always about the customer, right? But a B2B company is a little bit different because people aren't gonna be raving and like taking pictures of a they don't have a physical product to take a picture of. So in this case, you really want to go real hard on your customers in terms of your, your marketing efforts and little things that you can do to get people to share more, to get that viral coefficient up is what I think is going to get you that viral growth. And that's what we're going to be really focused on. So I'll have to look into cup sheet. Thanks for sharing that, uh, Dr. Rapasi. Um, Matt asked, what are your margins on the coffee? What are your margins on the coffee to accommodate discounts? Um, Matt, I, I don't know. Someone asked this earlier. Um, I'm just going to assume it's like 20 to 25%. It's, it's probably less. Um, <laughs> they're just saying you just want to break even. Um, it's probably less. Um, cause we're trying to figure out the shipping stuff and like shipping's really expensive. We're not charging the full price for shipping. So I'm not sure. I mean, Right now, I'd say like 20, 25% is probably safe. It's probably potentially a little bit high, but we don't care. We just want to break even right now. Uh, that's really the goal. Um, just trying to learn as much as we can. Um, so that's that's where we fall there. How much time? We have 12 more minutes. So we probably have time for a couple more questions before we wrap up here. If you have questions about the e-com house, if you have questions about the, the coffee business, told media, the marketing agency stuff. Um, have a couple, a little bit time, more time here before I hit the road. Hit the road. If you guys have suggestions for good podcasts to listen to, um, I always am like driving <laughs> when I'm like downloading podcasts instead of like doing it beforehand or audiobooks. I do like listen to audiobooks sometimes. I haven't done that in quite some time though. Um, but if anyone has some suggestions on some good audiobooks or podcasts to listen to, um, cause it's a, it's a little bit, a little bit of a drive. We got 25 hours. Um, I think it's 12 hours of Tennessee though, to Nashville, which is my goal. So if I, uh, I don't know if I'll make it to Nashville. If I leave at 1 PM, I still have to pack my car. So I probably won't leave till two. So then I would get to Nashville at like 2 AM. I don't know about that. So maybe I'll do 10 hours and then crash somewhere and then do another 14 tomorrow. Um, so Sunny asks, I'm interested in building my personal brand on TikTok and becoming an online coach, helping people with productivity, habit building, self-esteem, et cetera. Any suggestions? Okay, so Sunny, um, my suggestion would be to talk to people that are already doing this successfully. Like talk to people that are helping with productivity, with habit building, with self-esteem. Um, I would also... A big suggestion, Sonny, is like when you start, just pick one thing. Don't try to be everything. Don't try to do this, this. That's a big mistake a lot of people make. It's a mistake I made. It told media when we started. We're like, we're a product development agency. We can fucking do everything. Like, it would have been much better to be like, all we do is React Native development, nothing else. Don't talk to us unless you want React Native. Um, because then you convert higher. It's easy to get in front of your audience. Your message resonates much more. It, it, it makes every life very easy. So I'd, to start, Sonny, pick one thing that you really are great at, that you really want to do, and you can always change it. That's the, that's the great thing. It feels like you can't, but I promise you can. You can always change it. 
Second thing is maybe like reach out to people that are already in the same space and reach out to people that are doing the exact same thing, but in a different space. So it's not like necessarily competitive um, and ask them as many questions as possible because I know a lot of people, actually, I don't know a lot of people, but I know some people that are very successful in selling online coaching um, specifically for things like video marketing and different types of um, marketing type stuff. So it's not necessarily like habit building and that type of, of market. Um, but they're in like different consulting groups when they have like this peer network of people that help them. Um, and they give them a lot of advice and they show them how to like build the funnel a certain way, how to get in front of your audience, how to tell your story. So I would talk to those types of people so you can learn from them. It doesn't have to be in your same market. Um, so that's, uh, that's my suggestion on that. Um, <laughs> Matt Johnson says Marcus Limones would not be happy. Now here's the thing, Matt, Marcus Limones would not be, I, I love Marcus Limones, by the way. Um, I'm a huge fan. If you guys don't know, the profit is, uh, the show on NBC is Marcus Limones. Um, uh, Matt, I don't know my numbers yet. Like we just, I just started selling coffee like a week or two ago. So like, for me, I'm not going into this. Like I need to make this margin. If you ask me the same question in six months, I'll be able to tell you to a T here's my income statement. Like here's how much I spent on everything. Here's what I'm planning on deploying capital into right now. It's just, it's too hard. Cause I, I don't know things like shipping. I don't know what our cost per acquisition would, would be, et cetera. I do have a small financial model where I'm assuming things, but they're probably not super accurate. Um, Kirsten says, how I built this is a great podcast. There's some called The Comeback that's a great com uh, podcast. I don't know if you guys have heard of it, um, but you guys should check that out if you need a podcast. It's really good. Um, Ethan asks, what's your plan for the rest of the day? So Ethan, I'm going to, once this live stream is done, I have to put a bunch of stuff in my car, pack it up. The e-com house is all set. That's all settled. So that's good to go. So all I need to do is pack my car. It's, it's half packed. I have to finish it, then heading out. Um, whenever I do these types of trips, I don't book anything in advance. I'm not like, okay, I'm going to go book Tennessee or I'm going to go bush book, um, I don't know where else I pass through. Um, Deirdre, where else do I pass? Oklahoma? <laughs> Kansas City? No. Arkansas. Arkansas. Virginia. No, Virginia is too far north. I'm not going to get to Virginia. It's going to be in Tennessee. Oh, probably like the Memphis. Okay, yeah, probably Memphis, Knoxville. Yeah, I'm not gonna make it to Nashville. I don't think. So, so, so I'm not gonna be like, okay, I'm gonna book an Airbnb in, in Memphis right now. What I like to do is I'm on the road, and then once I get tired, I'm like, okay, here's how I'm feeling. Then I'll go book it, and then I'm gonna wake up as early as possible tomorrow and finish out the the rest of it. Um, today's been a crazy day though. I had so much to do today. Um, so it's been like nonstop. Uh, just stuff with the e-com house, with the call. Like I did work with Fernando, get all these coffee orders fulfilled. Um, I do stuff with the landlord. It was so much crap. Then me and my girlfriend are subletting this place, uh, her place. Um, and then, so I had to help her take care of that. So like, I like, I'm good with Facebook marketplace. So I had to post it for her and do all that stuff. And then I also still need to fill two rooms in the creator house. So I've been doing that stuff. And then we also have to get a lease. So like we're between two places. So I'm finalizing all that. So I do those calls today. So it's been a lot. Um, Dr. Posse says, Chris Vloss audiobook on negotiations. Great for fiction. The, the graveyard book is amazing. I'm going to take you up on that. Uh, Dr. Posse, I'm going to look into... Um, is, is the Chris Vloss... Audiobook is that the never split the difference? Is that Chris Voss? Let me see. Let's look it up. Chris Voss negotiation. Yep, I think it is. Yes, it is. Okay, I've heard good things about it. Um, so I'll have to look into that. Maybe I have it already. I'm not even sure. Um, let's see. Connor asks, why does the MDC team cost so much? Are they going to make you into a movie or a show? Um, so producing this stuff costs money, right, Connor? So we have two full-time editors. We have a full-time videographer. We have a full-time marketing director. And then uh, Deirdre um, is also on the team full-time. 
um, even though she's not getting pay, uh, compensated the same. Um, she's getting compensated a little bit differently, which you guys will find out in the next video. Um, but that costs a lot of money, right? You're hiring good people and they're all full time. So it caught, co it costs money to run this type of stuff. Um, but it's well worth it. Um, <laughs> Deirdre says that she loves the profit as well. Deirdre, I didn't know you liked the profit. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> she said we watched it together in quarantine when the pandemic first hit. Um, so Deirdre also loves the profit. Um, let's see. Sonny says, great suggestions. Thanks. Of course, Sonny. Um, okay. Review finds asks, what type of marketing do you do for your main business? So for Told Media, which is my software development agency, I do zero marketing. Never spent a dime really on marketing before the pandemic hit. I spent like, we were about to scale an ad campaign and spend thousands of dollars on marketing, but then the pandemic hit and we just turned it off. Um, I do all warm outbound sales to, that's how I grew, told me to do seven figures, warm outbound sales. Um, Dr. Raposi says, your team is doing awesome work. Can't thank you enough for taking everyone along on this journey with you such an open way. Of course, my man. Yeah, the team is freaking incredible. That's the worst, by far, the worst part about having to, to go back to Philly is not being able to spend time with the team in person. Um, I'd say that's that's uh, the saddest part about the, the actual move itself is I really, I actually, t it's funny because I tell the team I freaking hate MDC days on Thursday. So Thursdays, I don't work on anything other than the MDC stuff. So like we have our team meetings all day. It's literally from 8 a.m. or 7.30, something like that to like 8 p.m. Like it's all day just doing stuff. And I hate those days because I don't get to grow the business, but I also love those days uh, because I get to spend time with the team all day. So it's like a love-hate relationship. And I know I'm really going to miss those Thursdays. We're still going to do things virtually though. Um, <laughs> so I appreciate the support by the way, Dr. Rapasi. Um, Mo um, Amir says, will you make full one or two full documentary videos in the end? Um, I don't think so. No. Um, that was never the plan. I mean, we probably could. We have a lot of footage. We probably could make like a documentary video of all of it. I don't know if it'd be that cool though. Um, but I don't think so. It's just going to be the the weekly vlogs that we put out. Um, moving forward after this project, maybe we'll think about um, how we continue doing projects like this. Like maybe I coach someone and take someone who's never ever started a business and they have a year to make their comeback. Um, I don't know if I want to stick to like the million dollar comeback. Um, because it's, you know, the more and more I've been in this pro, I hate that vanity metric. Um, I want people to know it's very possible to make a million dollars in a year. It's very possible to do that. Um, but it also goes against a lot of my morals. Like I'm more on the side of being patient and you don't need to go and make a million dollars in a year. That's not the goal. The goal is you want to be happy. You want to figure out what makes you happy. You want to figure out how to cover your living. You want to figure out how to get on your feet. You want to figure out like, how do you work on something you're passionate about? If you're passionate about something and it's not going to make a million dollars, but you're super happy doing it, well, fuck making a million dollars. So it does go against a little bit of like those type of morals, but also it's like, yeah, you can make a million dollars in, in a year. So um, that's kind of why we chose ended up choosing that name, but it looks like we are about out of time here. Um, thank you every, oh, we did have, I always forget to look at the actual questions um, on Instagram. I forget there's a question box, but like I said, we're about out of time. It is 1 p.m. Thank you so much everyone for joining this uh, come back live stream. We do this every Monday at 12 p.m. CST. That might change. I'm moving to the Northeast. Maybe it'll be 12 EST. We'll see. Um, 
I got to go. Got to finish packing the car. Appreciate you all for joining. I will see you in next week's live stream.